So it's super great to talk off the chairs here. It's a very related topic. So I'm going to talk today about criminal enterprises from Rio de Janeiro, basically. So we are in an inequality conference, and we typically use favelas and slums uh, to show, I think it's a clear portrait of the inequality we face across the world, and particularly in Latin America. And Rio de Janeiro is a, is a city market by, uh, in its landscapes for its favelas that have all the problems that we typically have in slums across the world, like segregation, problems with access to infrastructure, and poor social economic indicators. But in the case of Rio, on top of any, all of this, we have a huge problem with violence. This graph shows the number of gunfight, the number of days in the city of Rio that you have at least one a report from a civilian that there, is, there was a gunfight in a particular place of the Rio. So basically, like, it's a, at least 200 days per year, and as we see in this graph, mostly take place in the favelas. And why this happened? Uh, the problem of the city is that we have several armored criminal groups that are located mainly in favelas, but not only. Uh, some of these criminal groups are drug factions, drug syndicates. The most famous one is Comando Vermelho, which was created in, inside the prison system in the 70s, but in the 80s it starts to use the favelas as a place to sell cocaine. And because this is a super profitable market, uh, this soon led to uh, increasing disputes among gang members, and as a result, some gang members left and create two other groups that are Terceiro Comando and Amigos dos Amigos. And this fractionalization led to more battles over the control of the favelas and the increasing militarization of their gangs. So, and, but what is increasingly striking in the city is that yet over the three days of escalation, the syndicates never, neither disappeared nor adopted non-violence strategies toward the state. And in addition to that, we also have in Rio police-linked militias. What is that? These are armed groups led by police and former police officers that began to dispute territories with drug gangs. In the beginning, they were viewed as a necessary evil, uh, although uh, because they are like they would free the communities from drug dealers. Uh, they also dispute territory control with drug gangs and sometimes uh, between them, and and even, but they typically collude or partner with govern, government officials to avoid repression. And what the police does in that context, oh, sorry, and before that, so militia groups has another particular uh, characteristic. It mostly operate in protection markets, but are increasing accounts that they explore several markets in the city. Uh, they are involved in retail of gas canisters, illegal gambling, and local transportation, and increasingly in land and construction. So, uh, and if we go to the city nowadays, people would consider that this is one of the main threats for public security, and there is a widely idea that they are expanding a lot. But we know we've not much for the hard data on that. So what governments do, what the police do, so you typically like they react to that with very violent military raids. So the police in Rio is not that they are not present. They typically do not patrol favelas, but they typically they are intermittently involved in police incursions, super violent too, with like hundreds of policemen, heavily armed. And for you have an idea on how the police is violent in Rio, uh, last year the police alone killed officially uh, 1,300 people. This represents, it means that the police alone is responsible for an homicide rate of 8 per 100,000 in the city. And this has been quite stable over years, but uh, striking homicides committed by civilians has been decreased a lot in the city in the last 10 years, particularly in the last four years, and it's down to the lowest level in, that we have recorded. Uh, so what we're going to answer here, what we, the questions is, is, in order to understand this dynamic, to understand what they are doing, how they are expanded, first we need to have data on where they are. So 
We want to show where the armed groups operate, how they expanded over time, what are the incentives to criminal groups to engage in turf wars, when the state intervenes, and why do some groups are able to increase its economic outreach. So the key challenge to do that and to understand criminal groups is to measure where they are. So what we do in this paper is that we use DISC Denuncia. DISC Denuncia is a very important crime hotline in the city that there are more than one million reports over the last 15 years to DISC Denuncia. But we use this, typically people call this denunce and describe what, what is going on and request for any type of help. So we're gonna use this denunce and not just to try to track mentions of drug factions and militias, but actually we automatically interpret the content of each report and propose a rigorous definition of group present based on armed con territorial control and exploration of economic activities. So pretty much what we do is that we try to classify the reports on whether they are reporting such as these examples. There are, they are heavily armed, they are exploring activities, they are carrying guns, uh, charging mon monthly cash fees, and we are discarding all the reports that simply mention there is a miliciano around, someone, uh, there is a funk party, or whatever. So how we did that, so we have like, uh, we create regular expressions to classify the reports to mention whether they refer to armored territorial control that we define as armored circulation or roadblocks or any type of surveillance. And we have a second dimension, which is the exploitation of economic activities, which can be extortion or any charge of fees, illegal goods and service, and uh, from drug trade to gambling to property crimes to also legal goods and service. So in a complement to what Chelsea was, no, was telling that we have huge presence in listing markets there too. So basically, so we got from, we went from 1.4 million reports that we filter militia and drug gangs name, we classified these reports, but then the crucial difficult here is that this is a civilian report that was not have been investigated and uh, confirmed. So. What we do in a nutshell is basically like, so this is a zoom of what is going on. So each dot is a report. So anytime it's colored, it's because it's these reports, they mention the terceiro comando puro, these, the, the red ones mentioned comando vermelho, and the, the, the black ones mention militia. So when you look at a map like that, it's, it's clear that terceiro comando is here, clear that militia is here and some indication that CV is here, but I cannot take just one like that and say that the CV is there. So what we do is that we aggregate this report, these dots, by like creating clusters, and whenever, and we did that for the whole period of analysis, so it's important to say we, our opinion database go from 2008 up to 2019, because we didn't want to include the pandemic period, so anytime in a cluster that, that, like that, we have a mention of the group name plus two mentions of the armed territorial control and two mentions of uh, exploitation of economic activity, we mark as the evidence that the group is present there. So it's a very strict definition. So we really want to get rid of false positives. So we really want to say that when the group is there, the group, it's really, we have good evidence on that. So we can do that for the whole metropolitan region. And what we want to track is this kind of phenomenon. So this year here in this neighborhood in 2009, we have indications of Comando Vermelho, Milicia, and TCP. Then 2014, Comando Vermelho and Milicia, and then the Milicia consolidated it, it control. So this goes to the panel data set as, as dummies that indicate whether you have more than one group two or more groups over most of the period, and then just militia controlling the area. So these maps on clusters turns to maps on neighborhoods. Pretty much we have most of the neighborhoods with at least one group. And we also are able to track the economic, what they are doing in terms of economic activities. So we have a big list and typically like, and we see whether this percentage means that they, they, the groups were uh, mentioned that they were exploring this activity. So pretty much what we see 
is that, as we know, drug gangs are focused on, on drugs, drug gangs are focused on drugs and militias on extortion, but we also see militias selling drugs and uh, drug gangs doing extortion, and we have a full list of activities they are involved in. And militia is much more diversified than drug gangs, but we do have drug gangs investing in several other markets. And we also capture variation over time. There are activities that are decreasing, such as TV, internet, and transportation, while others, such as electricity and water, is increasing over time. So what are we doing with this data? So we have a, a model in the paper that I don't have time to go through it. But basically, what we want to model is like, are the incentives for investing in military capacity or not, what we call fight and the state intervention. So first, we do a setup with one criminal group and state intervention, another with two criminal groups and state intervention. So the crucial thing here we want to model is why, why territorial control matters so much. It's because they derive profits from this territory. There is a cause to fight, and the government in the state, it does have political returns with whole about fighting these groups. But there is an, uh, a condition that the, the groups can also bribe the state in order to not intervene. And there is G, which is our economic losses promoted by the state, which you can think about drug seizures, uh, weapon seizures, and so on. And what we claim is that the key difference between militia and, and drug gangs is G is the fact that because militias are linked to the state, they are able to reduce the economic loss because they, they got to know when they happen or, or they even can avoid this type of intervention. So what we show is that we have two equilibriums with, that can be the violent one and the peaceful one, and for the militia it's easier to get to the, to the peaceful one because not fighting is a dominant strategy even when the state intervenes. Then we look at what happens when you have more than two groups, and what happens is that you have much more incentive to fight, and the reason for that is that you have the constant threat of a, the rival to, group to come and conquer your territory. So even though, so it's really what we want to model here is the fact that in, the, in this context, we have two enemies, the state and the rival criminal, criminal group, and this creates a very uh, violent scenario. So with this model, we have three predictions. One is that areas with more than one criminal group are more violent because they experience more conflict and state repression. Areas with, second, is that areas where there is crime consolidation and that we see that is an isolated criminal group. They are less violent if controlled by a militia group rather than a drug gang because the state intervene less. And criminal groups, especially the militia groups, exploit more markets when not facing the threat of a rival, rival group. So how do we test that? We have a panel of neighborhoods. So we regress three different measures of violence on the number of criminal groups, and then we split the number of two criminal groups in types of groups. And we have neighborhood and year fixed effects, so we are really exploring the change in group composition, change in group number to see the effects of violence. So basically, the odd columns of this table show one type of regression that has been run by other papers in the literature that basically shows that the increase in the number of the groups are associated with more homicides, shootings, and police killings. We use here police killings, it's important to say, it's the official measure of police killings, and we interpret that as a proxy of police inter, uh, military repression. And, but more interesting, in the odd columns, we split on, on, we break the, the, we have indicators for whether the neighborhood has two or more groups, only militia groups or only one drug gang. And the omitted variable here is neighborhoods with, without any group. So basically, we also see, as expected, that when you have two or more groups, you have more violence. But the most interesting thing is the difference of what happens when you have just one group, whether this group is the militia or whether this group is the drug, drug gang. Basically, when you have just the militia, there is no more homicides and police killings, but it does have, when you have just one drug gang, is associated with, with 27% more homicides and 47% more police killings. 
Second, the second exercise we're going to do is to see how this, the composition of the groups affect economic diversification. Why we say it's economic diversification, the type of economic activity they are exploring. So we use this denuncia to, to identify whether the, the, the neighborhood indicates that militia is, or, or the drug gang is doing extortion, drug trade, and then we create an index which are the number of other export markets they do. And here in this exercise, the explanatory variable comes from another database from an anthropologist in Rio at the favela level, which basically tries to capture this change here. What happened when you are a criminal group isolated from other groups, and what, uh, and this, and what, what happened when you have uh, other criminal group nearby you. And so one is the dummy variable here, it's one, whenever there is no other criminal group within one kilometer radius. So what we do is that we do this exercise separated to militia and drug factions. Uh, it again has favela fixed effects. It basically it shows that when militias operate without the threat or any other criminal group around, there is increase in extor mentions to extortion and an additional other market is uh, explored and we don't see this pattern for drug factions. And we interpret that to the fact that even when the drug faction is alone, it still has the threat of the state, and this is why it, it's not follow the same pattern. So in order to conclude, so we, docu we document that militia groups and drug factions are multi-product enterprises that explore a wide range of listy and listy goods and service. We show that the number of groups is correlated with high level of violence, but more importantly, we present evidence that neighborhoods with only militia groups have lower levels of homicide shootings, but higher level of extortion and economic diversification. And this creates a key challenge when we think about government intervention, because uh, this creates a really trade-off that you may have like low violence and higher economic outreach, and a lot of great part of the economy, the political science literature have been the, uh, defending this strategy of conditional repression based only like focus on group based on low levels of, in order to reduce violence. But here we have a case of a group that is being able to reduce violence but also increasing uh, its economic outreach, which is a huge challenge too for public safety. Thank you very much.